Welcome to another edition of Tech Bytes with Ron Nutter, your home for all things relating to smart home technology. In this episode, we're going to talk about managing DHCP on your Peplink B1 or B1 5G and other devices because they're all going to share some common traits. Hi, I'm Ron Nutter. We're going to be working on this together. This content is also available as an Amazon flash briefing or podcast. Please go to techbyteswithronnutter.com for more information. For any items mentioned in this episode, there will be affiliate links in the description. If you click on these links, I will get a small commission, but that won't affect the price you pay for the item. If you want to get notified when new content is uploaded, please click on subscribe and enable notifications. Well, here's what we're going to be covering today, and that's managing DHCP on your Peplink B1 or B1 5G. Spoiler alert. Some of this is targeted specifically at first-time admins, so bear with me while we help bring some of them up to speed because I'm just trying to help them get to where the rest of us are. Most of what's going to be discussed here is going to be available on other platforms. It gives you kind of some foundation stuff to work with. The first thing is going to be the DHCP overview. And there's some interesting things that, that go on that you may not see for a long time, if ever, but knowing how to recognize them will be a big help. Number two is we're going to talk about how to manage DHCP reservations, and that's giving the same device the same address every time. And there's only one time that's not going to work. But again, knowing how to do that, because there's some devices you don't really want to give a static address to by having to go into the configuration but what this will allow you to do is let DHCP handle that for you. Number three, restricting DHCP availability. Now there may be times you don't want a device to be able to get a DHCP address. Spoiler alert number two, if it's somebody other than you doing it and they know enough information they can still manually address IP in the other setting. This just helped keep things a little bit more manageable for you. And number four, we'll go over implementing DHCP options. And this is really the secret sauce of DHCP. So if you've got a voice over IP phone system in your company or your, your office, if you've got certain configurations you would like to hand out, like knowing a TFTP server to say periodically backup configurations to there's all sorts of things that you can do here but this gives you an idea of what we're getting ready to go into what we're going to do to help get our new fellow dhcp admins up to speed is we're going to do a review of how dhcp works now i'm going to gloss over a few things because dhcp can get into the weeds very quickly, but I'm going to kind of give you kind of a rough idea. And this is one of those good things that if you know how to do uh, packet capturing, this is going to be where you can really kind of see how things are working in the background. So we'll just start off with a single PC. And then over here, we'll have our DHCP server. Now, when a device, PC, you know, whatever you want to talk about, when it first comes online, it's going to send out a packet that basically is looking for DHCP. Or it's, it's called, I think it's DHCP Discovery. And then one or more servers will respond. If you have multiple DHCP servers, you know, for your larger networks, that makes a lot of sense. So, and it will respond. If I could write here. <laughs> and then once that happens... the PC will say, I need an address. And 
and then coming back the DHCP server will respond with and then the final part of the handshake for the most part is going to be an ACK from the PC as to what's going on. So this is a very simplified level going to give you a process of going on. It's, it's kind of like the three-way IP handshake if you've heard about it. And it's the, uh, it's ACK, SYNAC, ACK, I believe is, is the, if I remember the names correctly. So DHCP has a similar process. If you feel like learning a little bit about packet capturing, you can really kind of get into the guts of what's going on. And in the process of understanding more of what's going on, you can see what the DHCP server is doing. Now, I've had a problem, and I've only had this happen once, and there was a bug in a particular brand of laser printers that they weren't working with DHCP correctly. So if you were working with DHCP-related port security, you had all sorts of nightmares. It basically the printer would say, I need an address. And the DHCP would say, here's your address. And the printer would say, I need an address. And the DHCP server, well, here's your address. And the printer would say, I need an address. And it, it never would get to the ACK process. And there was a, uh, the printer company finally acknowledged the problem and did release a firmware upgrade. But that's where knowing how DHCP works is going to help you a lot moving forward. Now we're going to show you how to do a DHCP reservation. As with anything, there's more than one way to do it. So we're starting here in the dashboard. So we will go to status, client list. It may take it a little bit for it to come up. So you can see I've got two items out here that gives you their IP address and the MAC address, and the MAC address is the key thing to know about here. And it, for good measure, it shows you your SSID they're coming in on. Now, some DHCP servers will hand the addresses out sequentially. Others of them use kind of a, I'll call it a scattergun approach. So that's something to keep in mind is they won't always be sequential. Now, we've got two ways of doing a DHCP reservation. We can either click the little label button and it will copy the information to a DHCP reservation. So it's got your MAC address, your IP address, and the host name. Now you can override that there if you want to in terms of the host name. And unless you want to come up with a different IP address, I would leave it there. Don't touch the MAC address field. And there's only one exception when you would is if for some reason you had to change the network card, the network card is going to have a different address. Now there are ways with some systems that you can go in and change the MAC address, but don't expect that to always be there. So we'll click on save and we'll have to click confirm. And then if we go over here to Okay, so change is applied. Okay, so it's happy. We'll go over here to network, untagged VLAN, and we'll go down here and see it already has it recorded. So that's one way of doing it. Your other option is to just simply enter in whatever host name you want. Make sure you copy the MAC address, put in the static IP you want, and then click the plus sign. And then you'll have to go up and click the little piece above it. You notice we can change the MAC address field. That's handy for the situation I just described and it will let you change, keep, keep the same reservation for that machine even with a change in MAC address. If you weren't able to modify the MAC address, this keeps things working as you move forward. Well now that you've seen how to apply DHCP reservations, 
I'm going to show you how to deny service. So what we'll do is we'll go over here to status, client list, and after a while, a lot of this will become second nature for you, especially working within the PEP links as to where to find things. Now, say you've got, I'll pick on my, my smartphone here. Say you do not want it to be able to get an address either plugged in or over wireless. So you will just go over here to ban client and we'll click OK. And it says access restriction in action. Some clients are currently banned. So let's click on client restrictions and it shows you that you blocked it. So it doesn't require a restart. It just simply the DHCP server now knows that it sees if that MAC address comes up, that it's basically to turn to a deaf ear to it. And so you notice now that it's saying, uh, and it's only for one day. Interesting. Okay, that has to go with your DHCP lease time. So that's a way of doing it. And if you, when you want to release it, you can either, let's see, can we get to it? No, we'll, we'll click on access restriction. Okay, so we can, you have to go under, okay, you go to access restriction and then unlock client and now we can allow address. Okay, that's option number one on how to deny access. Now, both that option and the one I'm getting ready to show you, the only thing this doesn't get around is if somebody knows enough about IP that they can manually sign the information. So unless you've got filters in place or rules in place that block certain addresses, they can still have a way to get in. They're just going to have to work a hard, lot harder for it. Now, here's the section, second option for doing this. We go under network, and in my case, untag VLAN, because I don't have multiple VLANs. If we change down here, if we go to the address range that it's allowed to give out, so if we take it to, say you only want 10 devices online, so we can change that to a 20, and it still is going to hand out, you, you, you want to be careful when you change the subnet mask because that has to do with routing and identifying what is local to that subnet. So that generally you won't have to go change. Now, least time, unless you have a, a lot of turnover in devices, say like you're having, you know, friends come over for LAN parties or gaming parties, there's really not going to be a reason to have to change this unless you're running tight for available addresses on your DHCP segment. And then in that case, you may need to go to a supernet, which is like a slash 23, which would be 192.168.50.0 to 192.168.60.0. Whatever, but it's you're increasing the pool that are put in uh, an additional VLAN, so that gets you taken care of. And then, of course, we got to apply it because we made a change. It takes it just a little bit here to get set up, but nothing that's a problem. And change is applied. So uh, you can see we now have restricted the number of addresses. We haven't changed the subnet mask. Didn't have to but we've kept the number of addresses available so something won't just automatically come up onto the network. Now, like I said, if they pick an address outside of this range, that's something that you have to control via your firewall rules to only allow certain things to happen, but that's not something you should need to do on a daily basis. Now we're gonna get into the secret sauce in DHCP, and that's something called DHCP options and there's several options to look at here the one thing that if you've got especially cisco voip phones you'll be looking at an option let me get back over here I'll have to edit here, I'm afraid, but that's the 115.66. Okay. Damn it. Oh, 
Okay, there we go. Let's go. Now we'll just go move it forward from here. All right. Now, for Cisco VoIP phones, you have two options to look at. If you have a single TFTP server you're using, you use option 66. Now, for, and for smaller installations, that may be fine. But if you're going to be dealing with a larger installation or you simply can't have TFTP down, then what you'll do is look at an option 150. And this allows for multiple TFTP servers. There's no right or wrong way to do this. That's going to be pretty much up to you with what you want to do. Now, another option that you may want to, to look at is one called option four. And this allows you to specify NTP servers to be used by the client. Now, some devices may not accept this setting and, and there's really not any way of getting an error message back that you'll know that they rejected it. It's just that if the IP stack or the application that needs to use or listen to DHCP is not set to expect that as, as an offering, then this may not work. But this gives you just a few of the ideas on what to do. So we can flip over here to our peplink server and we'll go down here into the untagged VLAN and you see down here where it says under DHCP server extended DHCP options we'll click add now you can pull your list from right here so there's the number four we already talked about now the description here it depends on on what you're doing for the TFTP now, TFTP was one that it said IP address. So that's, so if we go here, now they're saying name, but name versus IP, it should allow either. I've seen some specific situations where that's not the case. Now, click on here, and if we go down, we'll go down the list here. And you see, for, like for option 150, it doesn't give a name. So if you've got an application that's using a custom uh, DHCP option, it, it doesn't matter. They support all the way down to 254. So you've got a lot to work with here. A lot of these you may never use. But for example, the uh, boot file name if you've got workstations booting across the network, of course, as part of the process, you'll have to tell them where their boot server is, and then you can give them a name to go with. There's all sorts of options to work with here. So this is something that as you grow and need to start doing more, there's more things here to work with that will make this a very flexible thing to have knowing how to make DHCP work the way you need it to. If you're watching this on YouTube, you will see videos on the screen that are similar to the one you've just watched or other content that YouTube thinks you might be interested in. If this video helps you or provides value, please click on that like button, thumbs up. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, please click on subscribe now and enable notifications. See you in the next episode. Thanks for watching.